Welcome to worship in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Today is Palm Sunday. Hosanna, loud Hosanna. You're going to have a chance to use that, Mike, and everyone else, um, during our first hymn. When we sing, I want you to be waving your palms, just like they did in Jerusalem. Um, I want to just make a couple of announcements. Um, your last chance to get a fish, to fill, put your pennies and coins in here, or make a donation to one great hour of sharing. Um, this is an important collection for the greater church uh, all over the world, and it's used for lots of different ministries across the world. Pre um, Presbyterian Disaster Assistance uses part of it. Um, uh, people, or what's it called? People, self-development of people uses part of it and the Presbyterian Hunger Program uses part of it. So they are involved in worldwide ministries um, and they, they kind of count on this because it's been collected for such a long period of time. So if you're creative, take a fish from the back and color it, Matt, fold it up and put it together and then put your coins in it all week long and we will collect these and the envelopes uh, next week on Easter Sunday. So please pray about that and give to one great hour of sharing. There was something else and it's escaping me right now. Um, anyway, today, this day is often called Palm or Passion Sunday, and I think that's because we can't decide which we should celebrate, the Passion of Christ or, or the celebration of palms on the day he came into Jerusalem. And as such, it's because of this week, the roller coaster of this week, roller coaster of emotions, events. Today, the people were celebrating by Friday, they were screaming for his crucifixion, the same people, some of the same people. And so it's a roller coaster of emotions. And we're going to talk about that as we read the scripture, after we read the scripture from John's gospel. And so I, I think it's important for us to recognize that with the roller coaster of emotions this week in particular, don't lose sight today during our celebration, and we should celebrate. Don't lose sight of the scope and the largeness of the gift of redemption that happens next Sunday, okay? And everything in between that goes along with it. So I hope you'll join us on Monday, Thursday this week at 7 p.m. for worship. We are gonna serve communion on Thursday we're also going to serve communion on Easter Sunday, something we haven't done for the last several years. So join us for that. Um, and hopefully you've all been contacted by an elder. And so we know which service you're coming to, 8.30 or 10 a.m., and how many people are coming with you so that we can safely gather as we are today. I think that's about it. Um, let's be called to worship. No, we're going to do that. We're changing it up a little. <laughs> Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship, which is responsive. The parade today is just the beginning of our hope. But there will come a time of silence and mourning. Help us to be ready for that time, O oh Lord. Blessed is Jesus who came into Jerusalem on that day. Please stand if you are able to join us in singing our opening hymn, Hosanna, Loud Hosanna.
Thank you. Please be seated. Is that better? As God has greeted us with his peace, so let us pass the peace of Christ to each other by waving or putting your hand over your heart or displaying the peace sign. Thanks be to God. Christ make us one. The peace of Christ be with you all. And now our call to confession. Remembering the saints, I'm sorry, remembering the events of Jesus last week helps us to see ourselves for what we are. Sinners in need of a savior, a savior, praise God, we have in Christ. In all honesty and hope, we confess now our sins to God using our prayer of confession. Let us pray together. We love parades. We love the excitement the colors, the noise. Today we celebrate Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. His followers have stripped branches from the trees and waved them in the air. They have thrown their cloaks in the path of the donkey that his steps might be cushioned. And the scene is wonderful, but there is a reality here. The reality is that although we wave our branches and shout Hosanna, we have not always behaved as disciples. Too often we have wandered from the path of Christ and stumbled along on our own, leaving our way to be superior. We have turned from those who have needed help because it wasn't convenient for us to be help of service. We have done and said things that are not worthy of disciples. Yet here we stand in the parade ground wavering our branches. Forgive us, Lord. Help us to turn our lives around and truly serve you. Help us to really mean Hosanna. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Let Jesus enter our hearts and transform our lives today. As we ask this in his holy name, amen. As we are led to see the procession into Jerusalem and then to the cross, realize the power of God's love through the gift of Jesus Christ. Make that love a transforming agent in your life so that, finally, your celebration may truly reflect faith and joy in Jesus Christ. In him we are forgiven. <laughs> silences the shouts of the mighty, quiet within us every voice by your own. Speak to us through the suffering and death of Jesus Christ, that by the power of your Holy Spirit we may receive grace to show Christ's love in lives given to your service. Amen. We're going to do a children's message before the scripture readings, and Tammy has something she wants to tell us all. Especially kids like Tyler.
I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you will never have to walk in darkness because I am the light that leads to life. Okay? Pretty big words, right? Now, when I'm thinking of some of, some of these stories in the Bible, I like, to, I like to sort of picture them, right? So I'm trying to picture what the light of Jesus might be like, right? Remember, it lights up the whole world. So what about that? Do you seem like that would light up the world? Probably not. Um, how about this? This is an interesting light. It can curve around corners and stuff. A little bit better light, but I don't know. Do you think that's big enough to be Jesus' light? We'll just put it there. Okay, this is a pretty significant flashlight here. What do you think? You can see in the back, but again, not... So much. Okay. Come over here for a second, because I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna really show you a light here. Now this is more what I think of as Jesus' light, right? This is a light. All right. But you know what the Bible also says? It says that Jesus had to be lifted up, and and you think about Holy Week. When was Jesus lifted up? Where did he get lifted up to? Okay. Mr. Ed back there is going to join the children's message. Thank you. He gets lifted up on a cross. Now, that doesn't really seem fair, right? Jesus was, he didn't ever do anything wrong. He was sent by Jesus. But God said that he had to be lifted up. And here's one reason that I think that might be. So we just said this is, we're going to think this is Jesus' light, right? What happens if this light is down here by the ground? How much does it light up? Not much, just a little circle, right? But watch this. If I lift this light up, the higher I go, the bigger that light becomes. And I don't like heights, so bear with me. <laughs> and with the microphone. Okay. Now, look what happens when I get up here. This light, I can see clear back there to Brian at the sound system. Mr. Ed's over here. See the Peterman's over there in that corner. Can't quite get around the corner to see Ken, but I can see Pastor Jim, right? So that light gets lifted up. I'm going to come down and turn this off because it gets hot. So Jesus also... Jesus also tells us that we are lights, right? That because he has that light, we also become a light. And I want you to remember that through all the bad stuff that we think about in Holy Week, Jesus' death, him being treated very badly, he is still a light. And we're going to talk next week about sort of what happens at the end of the week. But I want to I'll give you that. So this week, when you're thinking of kind of all the darkness and the bad stuff that happens in Holy Week, I want you to remember that Jesus is the light that lights up the world. So when you're using that flashlight this week, just think about that, okay? So let's pray for a second. Dear God, thank you for bringing us together today, and thank you that we have children who are willing to come forth and, and listen to your word and to your message. Um, be with us this week through Holy Week. Um, you know, it's sort of an up and down thing. We think of the joyous entry into Jerusalem and we think of your death on the cross um, and we wait eagerly for your resurrection and our saving light. All these things we talk about in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Miss Tammy. This morning's Old Testament reading is from Psalm 118, verses 22 through 29. The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord has done it this very day. 
Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. With bows in hand, join us in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will praise you. You are my God, and I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. How many of you enjoy a good roller coaster? Come on, be honest. All right, keep your hands up. How many of you have ever enjoyed a good roller coaster ride? <laughs> Almost everybody. Oh, John, come on. <laughs> You're the holdout. Even though you feel really safe and sound when you hop into the car on the ground after waiting in line for who knows how long, and even going up that first hill, even though you feel safe and secure, you're buckled into your seat, you may be clutching the sides of the car, you know what's coming though, right? As your car reaches the top, you look over the side, up above the trees, you can see for miles and miles. If the sun's out and it's clear, you can see all kinds of things, people, cars, trees, plants, roads. And for that moment, you have a sense of security and well-being. You're safe because the car slows down as it reaches the top, and you're nice and safe and secure there for the moment. Well, just when all seems right with the world, you suddenly know that because of gravity, you're going to scream down that hill ahead of you all the way to the bottom faster and faster and faster without any brakes. And you suddenly know that sense of excitement in that moment. So whether you love roller coaster rides and enjoy them at every opportunity you have, or you will never ride another roller coaster again because you hate them, you still recognize that it's a wonderful mixture of feelings on that ride. And that mixture of feelings, and maybe more than this, grounded safety, uh, trusted security, visual pleasantness, Gradual joy, and then creeping concern, sudden fear, and a rush of excitement. All mixed into one ride for about two minutes. <laughs> Maybe longer. Today we celebrate and we remember Palm Sunday, and we have all heard the Palm Sunday story before. So maybe you thought like I did, or I have, that this is exact opposite of Good Friday, the experience of Good Friday. It's pretty much exactly opposite. Because this was Sunday, Palm Sunday, and we know Good Friday's coming. We also know that Easter Sunday or Res Resurrection Day is coming. And it's kind of like a roller coaster of ride of our faith and our emotions and the events. It had to be the same for many groups of people in Jerusalem on this day and in this week. This triumphal entry into Jerusalem is narrated in all four of the Gospels. It's in Matthew 21, it's in Mark 11, it's in Luke 19, and in John, which we're going to read in a moment, chapter 12. For John, Jesus' arrival is a fitting fulfillment of Old Testament scriptures, several Old Testament scriptures. And the differences compared to the other Gospels with John is that his, his version is a little shorter on the actual arrival of Jesus in Jerusalem than the others. 
So let's read from John's Gospel, chapter 12, verses... We're only going to read 12 through 16, not 2 through 16. So starting with verse 12. Hear God's word. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the feast heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. May God bless our hearing of his word this day. All praise, honor, and glory go to him. Would you pray with me, please? Loving God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, our rock and our Redeemer. Amen. So here we are at this grand parade with all the people waving their palms and throwing their cloaks, coats, wraps, and their Ralph Lauren sweaters down in the dirt on the pathway before Christ. It looked like someone had emptied all of the veterans and Salvation Army bins into the street. That had to be what it looked like. People were cheering, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. The crowds ran to palm trees, cut off the branches from them, and laid them before Christ as he approached on a foal of a donkey. Yea, Jesus, you're the Messiah. Yea, Jesus, we saw you raise the dead. Yea, Jesus, you've come to save us. Hosanna, Hosanna. But this was Sunday, and Friday's coming. As a pastor and as a preacher, I have heard and appreciated some very, very good sermon messages preached by other men and women. One of my all-time favorites is Tony Campolo's message called, It's Friday but Sunday's coming. Anybody heard of that message? Yeah, it's pretty well known. It's pretty, it's old now, but it's been around a long time. Dr. Campolo tells the story in his sermon of a little preaching competition that he had with his pastor, his senior pastor in the church where he worshiped. And it was during services at that church one day that Dr. Campolo describes how he was asked to preach. And he preached what he thought was the best sermon he had ever written. He had taken the congregation to the heights of glory and the depths of despair. So afterwards, he sat down beside the senior pastor in the front row, put it, tapped his knee and said, simply, top that. Well, this older black pastor looked at him and said, son, watch the master. And it was a simple sermon, starting very softly, building in volume and intensity until the entire congregation was completely involved in this message. They were chanting. The sermon went something like this, and this is just a small portion of it. It's Friday. Jesus is arrested in the garden where he was praying. But Sunday's coming. It's Friday. The disciples are hiding and Peter's denying that he knows the Lord. But Sunday's coming. It's Friday. Jesus is beaten, mocked, and spit upon. But Sunday's coming. It's Friday. See those Roman soldiers driving his, the nails into the feet and hands of my Lord. Hear my Jesus cry, Father, forgive them. It's Friday, but Sunday's coming. 
It's Friday. Jesus is hanging on the cross. Heaven is weeping and hell is partying. But that's because it's Friday and they don't know it yet. But Sunday's coming. By the end of this message, the old preacher was simply calling out, It's Friday. And the whole congregation was responding, But Sunday's coming. So on this roller coaster ride of emotions and feelings and events, on the Friday of this week, that same group of people would stand and scream, crucify him, crucify him. That same group of people that yelled out Hosanna would five days later scream for his blood. They would scream out that he'd be nailed to a cross. Does that surprise anyone? Does that shock anyone? Perhaps not, because we know the rest of the story. But if you were a disciple like Peter, James, or even John, or even the other nine that were there in Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, wouldn't you be a little bit surprised Possibly shocked, certainly dismayed, and definitely discouraged by the end of the week. But think about it. They shouldn't have been surprised, and neither should we. They shouldn't have been shocked. Jesus had warned them, and Mark had recorded it in chapter 4 of the gospel. Even though it was done with the use of parables, Jesus warned them that this is the way it would happen. He told them who he was. He revealed he was the Messiah, the Christ. He cast out the seed that the Messiah had come, and Jesus did miracles to prove it. But some people were like the hard ground in the seed parable. These people were so hard and so calloused and so bitter to the truth that it would bounce right off of them. The seed would lay on the surface waiting for Satan to sweep in and do everything he could to steal it away before it could take root in faith. In the crowd that formed around Christ, triumphant entry, there were Jewish religious leaders, Pharisees, who, who looked at what was going on, then weaseled their way closer to Jesus and said, teacher, get your disciples under control. There was another group who stood screaming, Hosanna, Hosanna. These were the ones that they had watched, who had watched and listened to Jesus before. They had seen him do things. They had seen him teach. There was a third group mixed into the crowd and they ran into the streets, ripping off their coats, grabbing palms, throwing them at Jesus's feet but they were like the seeds that fell among the thorns. Their loyalty and excitement did not last any longer than four days or less. In that crowd, there were also people, though, that heard the word, capital W, and in it, and it, or he, transformed their lives. It not only transformed their lives on Sunday, when they sincerely yelled, Hosanna, Hosanna, it transformed their lives on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. They saw hope and a future. They found relief and salvation in this man who was the Messiah. Then on Friday, the roller coaster ride continued. On Friday, their trust and belief were rocked as they watched him placed in a tomb eventually. On Friday, they wept great bitter tears and as the stone was rolled over in front of it. What can we learn today from the roller coaster ride of Holy Week beginning today on Palm Sunday? Well, let's begin with which group of people perhaps describes our own lives and faith. That first group of people that I described, some of those whom were even there when Jesus called Lazarus from the grave, had seen who Jesus was and they believed who Jesus was. They watched as the stone was rolled away and Lazarus came forward in his grave clothes. 
They may have seen him make dinner for everyone using five loaves and three fishes. A few may have been to the wedding where he turned water into wine. They were shouting with great fervency, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Today we are shouting with great energy also. And we should celebrate this way. But like that first group of followers, we are on a roller coaster of faith every day. We know the stories of Jesus' miracles. We have them written down. We know his identity. We know his great love for us. How strong, though, is our faith during the roller coaster challenges of everyday life? The second group, the religious leaders, Sadducees, Pharisees, Sanhedrin, all watched this Palm Sunday parade. Now, some of these guys hated Jesus right from when they first heard about him. And they knew that if he continued to live the way he was living, he would bring the powers of Rome down on their heads, and that with that, their comfortable lifestyle, power, and prestige, and leadership would be gone. I can almost imagine the Pharisees standing around on Palm Sunday watching this processional. They knew they had to do something or Jesus would bring an end to their way of life. You can almost hear Satan whispering in their ears with his poisonous, deadly voice. It's sudden. Now, I'm not going to call any of us a Pharisee in the 21st century, but are we tempted in these same ways? In our everyday Christian lives, do we think we are following all of Jesus' commands? We're good people. We're in worship every Sunday, or almost every Sunday. Because we're good people, do we kill Jesus and keep him in the tomb by our complacency and our lifestyle and our comfort? The third group that was mixed into this crowd is perhaps the group where most of us find ourselves today. This is the group of people who have allowed the thorns or pressures of life to grow up around them and choke out their faith. On Sunday... Today, they yelled, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But that was Sunday. On Monday, for this group, the bills came in. The Passover, the new Passover outfits for the kids were expensive. And that great new cell phone for mom came in the mail. How was dad possibly going to pay for that all? And how was he going to pay the mortgage and still have enough to buy food? Then on Tuesday, a Pharisee priest stops by and said, if they continued to follow this crazy man, Jesus, they would be excommunicated, shunned by their beloved church family. They would have no friends and no center of social activity anymore. They would be like outcasts. So on Wednesday, as the family walks through the marketplace to get the supplies for the Passover meal, they were criticized, they were mocked, they were teased because they had been there in Jerusalem on the street. They were called Jesus freaks. And the couple and the people wouldn't wait on them in the marketplace. Finally, by Thursday, when the good Christian lady's husband came home early from work and said he had lost his job because his wife was at the Palm Sunday celebration, rallying and yelling out, Hosanna, Hosanna, she lost her cool. She couldn't take the pressure anymore. She was upset and depressed at the same time. When Friday came, she was at the front of the crowd, teaching her children a new phrase. No longer was she yelling, Hosanna, but crucify him, get rid of him. If you imagine that you are there, 
You can almost hear the leaders in the community whispering behind the cheering crowds as Jesus rode down the street on the back of a donkey. Don't worry, it's Sunday, but Friday's coming. Friends, once again, it's not too difficult to fit ourselves into one of these groups or more than one of these groups of people who were on their own roller coaster that week, especially this week. Today, Palm Sunday will not remove your bills to be paid. Your Palm Sunday celebration and shouts of Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, will not make your life easier or increase your social friends or make you wealthy. But here's what happened to the disciples of Christ who were there and what can happen also to us. Yes, these followers of Christ were crushed on this coming Friday. Everything they screamed for on Palm Sunday was true, but now their faith was pierced by the three nails and dashed on the sharp edges of Christ's rocky tomb. On Palm Sunday, they believed he was the Lord, the Messiah, the Savior. On Palm Sunday, they believed everything they yelled as they cast palms at his feet. On Palm Sunday, they believed it all as they stripped off their coats and threw them down for him to cross. But that was Sunday. Eventually, Friday did come, and on Friday, it seemed as if it all had ended. It seemed that all hope was lost. It seemed. They stood around in dark rooms and dark, hidden alleys, talking and listening to one another and asking, were you there when they crucified my Lord? Another would ask, were you there when they nailed him to a cross? Another would ask through tears, were you there when they laid him in the tomb? It seemed as if Jesus' words, it is finished, meant that their lives were over. It seemed. Then, like the soft wind or a gentle breeze, a voice. Somewhere from the sky above or maybe from around the corner or maybe from inside of them spoke clearly. It was a voice as powerful and as soothing as if it came from God himself. It was as if the voice of God whispered, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. And the roller coaster ride continues because God rode along with them and so did his promises. I don't know what your roller coaster challenges are this week or any week, unless you tell me. Here's what I do know for sure, though. That the good news of the gospel, the word, capital W, the world is waiting to hear, is Jesus Christ's message of hope. When life begins to get you down, our word, capital W, of hope is that Sunday's coming. When the life or work you had counted on for many, many years is gone or changed and you feel that you may never know a normal life again, Remember, Sunday's coming. When you see what is happening in the hallways of our schools or in the streets of our cities, and you're angry and afraid all at the same time, we have to remember the words, Sunday's coming. When you've lost your belief in the miraculous and no longer expect anything good to come out of COVID-19, Look at the calendar and note that Sunday's coming. When you are so far down, you don't remember up. The word, capital W, for you is Sunday's coming. Yes, there is lots wrong with our world, but it is the hope of Christ that we need to sustain us. Indeed, it is the only hope that gets us through the darkest hours. I have hope. 
I have the same hope that those people in Jerusalem on this day had in the crowd. They were all on the same roller coaster, all of them, no matter what group they were in. They were on the same roller coaster this week, and so are we. On this first day of Holy Week, we know there will be a Monday, a Tuesday, a Wednesday, a Thursday, and finally, a devastating, death-dealing low point on Friday. But on that awful day, we can think again and recall a special time long, long ago. Then with heart and soul and every fiber in our being, we can shout and know that Sunday's coming. And so is our greatest hope. Amen. In our prayer time, we want to continue to pray for people, places, circumstances, situations, whatever's on our hearts and minds, and give those to God. Some of the prayers that were lifted up at 8.30 were for the people that experienced the tornadoes in the south. I think it was in the south. Um, all for their recovery, for their peace of mind, for God's hands and feet on the ground that are helping them to recover their lives. Also for Linda Troutman, Ken gave a review or a or a reminder or a report on Linda still being hospitalized and uh, thanks you all for the prayers and concern um, cards she's probably gotten cards too um, she's thankful for that and Ken told me earlier that yesterday it, she was the best he had seen her so she's still in the hospital and still recovering and they're still dealing with medication and balance and, and diagnosis and all of that. So her continued prayers for her and for Ken and Amber and Amelia, who are with us today, uh, prayers for all of them during this time of Linda's recovery. Um, we lifted up thanks, prayers of thanks for Ken and Pat Schulteis, who were in worship this morning at 8.30. Nice and tanned. They were both tanned, like they've been in Florida or something. So we're thankful that they have safely returned, and they were thankful for being in worship. Are there any other joys, concerns today? I'm sorry? Mike? John? We're glad you're back, John, and recovering so well. And in the last hymn, when you're waving your palms, I want to see you dancing in the aisle. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Anyone else? Aaron. Today is Brian. 15? How did that happen? We need to sing. Stand up, Brian. take our prayers to God.
Almighty God, we ask you to hear our prayers today for the church, for the world, for the local community, and people in particular need. We pray for the Christian church throughout the world. Almighty God, during this Holy Week, we ask you to encourage all Christians to draw close to you for their strength and their comfort. We particularly remember those Christians who suffer persecution as a result of their faith, those worshiping in dangerous places, those who can't worship at all. We ask your peace for them, your strength for them, your protection for them, and your loving care for them. Almighty God, we pray for the body of Christ here in Valencia. We ask you to pour out your Holy Spirit on this congregation, their friends, their families, so that they can show your love for each other and the local community and people around them. We pray for all who bring comfort, care, and healing. We give thanks for human love and friendship and for all that enriches our daily lives. Creator God, we pray for your world. We pray for the nations of this world embroiled in a long-term conflict and for communities scarred by political unrest and riots and violence. Grant wisdom to the world's decision makers. Guide them to work for peace and the well-being of all people. Lord, we particularly pray for all countries battling against the COVID pandemic and ask for a spirit of cooperation to find a way, ways to protect all people, to cure all people, <clears throat> and to love all people. Father God, we thank you for all those who help our community to run smoothly because of their jobs, because of their volunteer work, or just their personality of neighborliness. Help us to be supportive and encouraging and to step into situations where we can serve. Bless our neighbors and strengthen those who are working in your name in order to bring healing and comfort to those in need. Lord God, you've heard our prayers this day, prayers of thankfulness for a birthday, 15 years, prayers of joy and safe travels back home, prayers for concerns for people experiencing weather crises, tornadoes, hurricanes, floods. Provide for all of them your healing hand. Provide for all of them your strength and reassurance and take them by the hand and walk them through their recovery and lives, always drawing them closer. You've heard our prayers for Linda as she recovers, and we ask your, your blessing on the doctors and nurses and all those taking care of Linda, as well as for her and her family. Give them your peace, give them your wisdom. Help Linda to be strong in her faith as she recovers so that she can get back to serving you with her gifts. Lord God, we thank you for the recovery of others like John and the, um, the rehabilitation that occurs when our bodies break down. Thank you for being with him and healing him and thank you for healing all of us, especially in this coming week. Lord God, in this week, we know that there are many people who are struggling due to illness, lack of employment, financial problems, loneliness, or loss of loved ones. So Lord God, be with them, draw them close to you, and help them to be aware of your healing presence and your eternal love, expressed in the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. So gracious God, we thank you for bringing us together either in our churches or online, at home. We thank you for being our inspiration and focus of our praise. Send us out full of love, joy, and hope. Let our enthusiasm be infectious to those we meet, and may others be drawn to you, especially in this most holy of weeks. And Lord, we offer up all of these prayers in the strong name of Jesus, your Son, who taught us when we pray, to say these words. Our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We worship a God of abundance, a God of abundance from whose hand all of our blessings of our lives come. So may we be spared the sin of using all of those blessings only and simply for our own pleasure and comfort. God will give us right and generous hearts if we ask if and when our blessings flow from our hands to those who are in need. Let us continue to open our hearts and our lives in giving to God's work, however we can accomplish that, either in person, in worship, by mail, online, however we can give for God's work in the world. And let's pray for those gifts that we give this day and every day. Dear God, the wisdom of the world tells us to hoard what we own, to accumulate what we have earned, while you invite us to share what we have with those in need. Accept and bless all of our gifts for your purposes, that we may be your servants in this world. For we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand if you're able and join me in singing all glory, laud, and honor with your palms. church according to his power at work in us and all glory to Christ Jesus his son throughout all generations so the blessing of God the Father God the Son and God the Holy Spirit go with you this week and every week amen <laughs>